<laughs> now, you, you started your career with the BBC in 1952, and the, the days of, uh, the early days of television, live television, um, and that was an extraordinary period, wasn't it? And I understand that you had never seen a television program before you went for that job interview. Well, I must say, I feel jolly sorry for people who apply to get in television these days, because in those days, 1952, they were actually, the BBC was trying to persuade you to appear. <laughs> they were, really. I mean, um, in 1952, you know, this country started, well, including a Scots uh, engineer, I mean, uh, uh, invented, this country invented television and produced the first public service, uh, the first publicly viewable mm -hmm. television service in the world in 36. Mm -hmm. And it, we started again after the war in 46, I think, and I joined in 52, so it was effectively only six years old. Mm -hmm. um, and very few people had television sets. Um, the, there was a transmitter in Alexander Palace in London, which was again the first in the world, and we were hoping that one was going to build it, was going to open very shortly if it, if it hadn't. It was just about to in Birmingham. Uh, but that was it. And, and only a minority of people had it. Um, and uh, we were, it was all live. There was no method of recording uh, television electronic pictures at that time. Um, and so the programs uh, were, uh, I mean, they were really hit and miss. I mean, we were making up as we went along. And... Uh, there were half a dozen of us, and we were responsible for all non-fiction television in the United Kingdom. And, and that included quizzes, it included cooking programs, knitting programs. Knitting all... was one of my good ones. Yeah. <laughs> and I understand you became something of a specialist in knitting. <laughs> well, I produced a program on knitting. Yeah, I did. It's not a joke. I and did. you did the, you did the, the Queen's... The, uh, Queen's the Queen's Christmas message. Queen's broadcast came later. Yeah. yeah, and you also were, became a favorite of the Prime Minister of the day for doing his. I produced talks. Eden's broadcast, um, uh, and that was an extraordinary experience. I mean, I was summoned to Number Ten on the eve of of the British invasion of Suez, huh. and I sat sitting in Number Ten while uh, Anthony Eden uh, made this historic broadcast going to war. Extraordinary. Mm, was. Very funny, actually. Yeah. But now, was it, was it Eden or his predecessor? You, you recount the story in your autobiography of uh, how you were invited down to Checkers. You were just, I think, 26, 27 years old, a very young producer at the time involved in this activity. And you, uh, anyway, we won't go into that fantastic story, but you must read it, of, of having, having the wrong size trunks. Uh, yes. On the tennis court. Yes, rather than uh, about shorts, rather. Yes, yes. yes I'm try trying to play the prime minister with one hand holding up your shorts. That's correct. <laughs> That's correct. Yeah. yeah. All right. So, um, I, I was I was fascinated that you your your ability to see a, a future for yourself to to take charge of the situation and a sense one gets the impression to create your own destiny. Was uh, uh, took the shape when you created your own department and you gave it a name of uh, the department was the travel and exploration. Ah, yes. It was only me and a girl. <laughs> <laughs> what was her name? I mean, uh, well, a succession of girls. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I mean it was just. It was, a, it was fun. I mean, what happened, the, the half a dozen of us, eventually, as the thing grew, as, we, as more, more viewers meant more license money, more license money meant more programs, uh, and so you had more and more people join the television service, and when that happens, you inevitably start to specialise. And I wanted to specialise in the things which, which I was particularly interested in. Knitting. Well, yeah, but what? Knitting. knitting. Yeah. But, but I, yeah, so I got out of knitting and, and started on natural history and travel, uh, which I thought in the end, if I played my cards right, might get me to somewhere interesting, which, which I have to say, I've been playing that card ever since. <laughs> and, and these were the days, of course, during when you initiated ZooQuest. Yes. Um, and you took, uh, I, th I believe you did the first natural history program uh, for ZooQuest in uh, the BBC did in Africa. In West Africa. In West Africa. Tell us about that, that experience. Well, um, the, the, 
uh, if we're talking about te television techniques, in, in that time, the BBC didn't, ha didn't shoot 16mm film at all. Hmm. Um, the, the money that came to, for, for the television came actually from the radio licence. And the people in Broadcasting House regarded the people sitting up in Alexander Palace as being sort of slightly naughty boys, you know, who would have their little fun but were not serious. And so they, if you applied to Broadcasting House and said, I want some money to make film, all these chaps would say, Phil, my boy, no, 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 you've got television. Here's all little television cameras. Go and play your little games in the studio, <laughs> but, but don't ask us for money. Um, and so we did very little filming in that time. Mm. Um, and I wanted to get to Africa, so how could you possibly get to Africa on that basis? How? And so I discovered that a friend of mine in the London Zoo was going to take an expedition to West Africa to look for rare birds and odd animals and collect them, because that's what zoos did in that, those days, in the 50s. And I thought, if I went there with a camera, with a film camera, I could film little sequences of how this chap went about the work. And then when he jumped on a python, or whatever he did, um, he would stuff it into a sack. And then when we got back home, I would be able to show that sequence on film and then show him live in the studio. And thereby, you could get away with a half-hour program with only about 12 minutes of film. Mm. So that was uh, an economic way of doing it. And that's, that's in, in fact, what we did. Um, the, the, the problem was that after the first program, uh, Jack Lester, who was the curator of reptiles, who was the man in question, mm. became very ill. Uh, and because there was this live ingredient in the program, uh, and it was advertised in the Radio Times, somebody had to do it. And so the head of, of television said, OK, you were the guy who was there, you better do it. And that's the only reason I ever appeared on, on, on the screen. Because initially, I, uh, I believe, uh, they weren't so keen to put you on the screen. They thought your teeth were too big. Yes, well, that is true. That is, uh, they're, they're <laughs> I was, in those days, again, you see, you just hung around the studio and things happened. And I was, uh, I was in the studio. <laughs> your teeth shrank? <laughs> <laughs> no, well, they, they, uh, when I applied for this training course, they were looking for someone to do an interview, uh, just kind of off the shelf. And they said, would you come and interview this chap? And I interviewed um, uh, um, a marathon runner, uh, well, or at least a long distance runner, uh, who was an Olympic runner, uh, mm. but he wasn't, he wasn't a brilliant uh, conversationalist. And I remember um, uh, trying desperately to get him to open up, mm. as you're doing, at this very minute. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> See? And, 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 uh, and I said to him, uh, now, I, uh, uh, you are uh, uh, running uh, uh, in, the, in the four miles. And he said, yes. And I said, uh, uh, and uh, is, is it, uh, do you enjoy running four miles? And he said, yes. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, uh, and do you have uh, any particular training methods? And he said, yes. And I said, well, could you tell me what your training method is? And he said, yeah, I run in obno boots. <laughs> so I said, uh, why do you train in hobnail boots? And he said, because when I take them off, I'll go faster. <laughs> uh, and that was the end of the interview. And, uh, and not surprisingly, uh, as I discovered later, um, memos went round in the bit of the television saying, this chap, Attenborough, is a nice enough fellow, reasonably intelligent, but he is not to be used again <laughs> as an interviewer because his teeth are too big. 